is up next with the talk. He'll do his introduction. Yes. Uh, my name is Ulf Monson. I'm working for a company called Ad Phoenix. We are selling services to real estate agencies. Uh, this will be more uh, like a little bit softer presentation. Uh, it will not be that deep into technologies, but it will be how you use technologies. So I will talk about uh, 10 plus years, I would say, experience of internal development platforms that I've been part of creating. And, uh, and I will talk about why it can act as a turbo for business growth. Maybe some of you recognize this car. It was like a hot car in the late 70s. Maybe a lot of you was not even born at that time. But this was Saab, a Swedish car, that they introduced the turbo engine. I think they were the first car maker to do that, actually. And by that, the car accelerated much better and much quicker than most of the other cars. And I would say it's the same with IDP. IDP can help your company to grow much quicker. Uh, so this is just my job title, I would say, for the last 15 years. Maybe you all recognize this, like sysadmin, infrastructure engineer, infrastructure architect I've been, infrastructure developer for a while, SRO engineer, manager, DevOps engineer, plumber, <laughs> plumb plumbing infrastructure. Uh, DevOps architect, pipeline expert, DevOps specialist, infrastructure ninja, I prefer, prefer that one. And maybe now it's a platform engineer that I should name myself. I didn't know that when I started with this 12, year, 12 years ago. But it seems like a platform engineer is the new hot thing. And I would say my job title has never been a YAML engineer. The main reason because I never become a YAML engineer is that that was quite lazy. I really like to automate stuff and not, not, not manage YAML code. Uh, when I was going to do this presentation, uh, I thought that I should do, get some help. Uh, I did like a, pre a presentation like 10 years ago that was uh, become quite popular. And at that time, my daughters was like five and eight years old. And I have them to help my, me with the presentation. So I just gave them the title of the, pre, of the slide and they, they just draw something on it. You can see that on the top. Uh, now they are like 15 and 18 years old. So I asked them actually, because they're quite too good to do painting and things like that. I asked them and I said, that you will get some money as well. But they said that they have more busy, important stuff. And actually this morning, my daughter sent me a, uh, SMS and she, or a message, and she sa says she had a problem with the gym card because it will expire tomorrow. Then I say, okay, we fix it later on today. No, we need to fix it now. No, but I'm preparing a presentation for 600 people, I say. And then she said, no, but it's more important with my gym card. Can you fix it now, Dad? So this is about dead ops, but it doesn't work very much these days to ask the kids to do something. But then I got into Delhi, and then there is a Swedish pen painter called Oslund that is quite famous in Sweden. He's doing a lot of landscape draw, draw painting and things like that, or did. Uh, and I, I tried to use Delhi on that one to get drawings that looks like his drawing, but it's failed quite badly. But he was inspired by Paul Gagin, and he was uh, actually one, uh, Paul Gagin was a teacher for Ostland. I, I like his drawing as well, and that works a little bit better. So you will see some drawings here. But then after a while, my credits run out on Dali, because you need to, so it's just a few slides with some painting. So here is one painting. So I think I own the, own the painting, actually, because I created it. So about uh, IDP. I would say this is a good definition I find about the IDP. It's a platform built by a platform team. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not needed, but it's to build golden paths uh, and also enable developer sensors. And I think those things are really, really important. It's to do, be able to do the thing in the right way, to have golden paths that work seamless for the developers to get things into production and configure infrastructure. And it's also important with this self-service that they can do it by themselves, that they don't need to ask someone or don't need help or something like that. 
also that they don't need, need to learn a lot of new technologies or languages or anything like that. <coughs> also about IDPs, like, I don't think it's a product you can buy. There are some companies trying to create those IDPs, but I, it's not a product that you buy. It consists of many different technologies and tools, and those are specific for your company, I would say. You, you take the tools that you have and you try to glue it together, and you add with some other technologies as well. To make it easy for a developer to get things out in production. As I said before, I'm, why, why, we, why I like IDPs is because I'm lazy. This is from my summer house in south of Sweden. This is my tractor. And actually I prefer to run with my tractor instead of doing other stuff or, or work and things like that and also queries or things like that. And also I, I always take tools that exist. It's not like I create a new config management tool because I don't like the config management tools or something like that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm happy that all of you are doing this thing because then I can be lazy and I can do, do things. But it's not only for me personally that it's good with IDP or internal developer platform. It's for the business as well. And I think the super most important thing is the speed of feature development get the feature deployed, and as it was in the discussion or talk yesterday, deploy, get the feature deployed into production, that's the most important. If you put a lot of feature branches uh, and it's not, never deployed, then there's no use of it. So, and uh, I think it was just humble, let's say, deploy, uh, done, deploy is done, done. So, and, but by IDP, you can improve, improve the speed of uh, feature development. Also from a cost perspective, because with the IDP you have control, much better control of the, of the cost and things like that, and you can optimize your operation, for example, and that's super important those days, when you have those huge bills from AWS. Also about quality, it's easier, you need to fix it only in one place, and not in like many different repos, or many different teams need to fix it. You can fix a lot of stuff centrally with the IDP. And also, it's also easy to adopt infrastructure to new requirements. Uh, like we had, like we had, uh, got some U.S. customer the last six months. Big, big companies, much bigger than the companies in Europe, and they put a lot of requirements on security. Like you need to do OWASP scan and things like that. And then we can implement that in the IDP. So we can implement that without having a developer involved in, in, in that implementation. The only thing they need to fix was if the scanning f finds some bugs and things like that. But we need, didn't, need, didn't need to disturb the team to do like adding scanning and things like that. So, but it's not only me that, that, that looks into this. I think this was a quite good study done, I think it was last year, by Amanitech, DevOps setups. I think maybe I read it. <coughs> and it was to try to find, in the same way as State of DevOps, try to find the top performance of what they are doing. And one thing, they're using loosely a couple architectures, top performance, and that's, that's why, where you need IDP when you have like Microsoft, things like that. If you have a big like monolith, then maybe it's not the same need of uh, IDP. And then you use public clouds, uh, and then configuration as code, and also infrastructure as code solutions. Uh, and then we continue that one. Uh, and uh, most of them are using container technology. I don't think you need to use container to technology to be top for my run business where we do, did a lot of auto scaling EC2, and that works perfectly as well. Uh, and uh, this. And you need to deploy every day, or at least 80% did that. And also that it doesn't take like weeks to get it in production. But the last thing there in the report, that they say that almost 100% of, of the teams use developer, or developer can self-service themselves. So I think that looks like a super important thing that the developer can do. There is also a quite good book. This is like 25 years old or something like that. But and it's not a, It's about management. It's a, how you get the company from good to great. But there, they're talking about that you need to 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 have think about 
get into the core mission. I think it's the same for, for development or for, for a SaaS company or something like that. The core thing is to get the features out. That's the, like the core business. Uh, also. And the fun thing in this book was that one of the CEOs, he, he, uh, it was Dave Packard behind HP, uh, and he also liked to drive a tractor as well. So he was like, you don't need to work all the time, you should have a business that works by itself. It's the same with the IDP, if you're a platform engineer, it should work by itself and then you can drive your tractor or whatever you like to do. And I think with IDP you never edit YAML files. If you start to add a lot of YAML files, then I think you get have a problem. It's not about that. It's about automation, uh, automation, and also that you shouldn't like manage pets, like ma manage different repos or things like that, or different infrastructure configuration, things like that. Or uh, you shouldn't manage like Kubernetes cluster as pets. You should manage it as cattle. Uh, so, like I said, everything should be more or less dynamic. I, and I would say this is a pretty good definition if you have an IDP. You never edit JSON or YAML. You're never disturbed by a developer. Your management are really happy on you, what you're doing. And you also never get like titles, internal titles like employee of the month or something like that. Because normally when you work in operation, everything works, or with infrastructure, then no one will notice that you're doing anything. The only time they notice when you're doing something, that is when it fails. So you go under the radar and are happy by that. And then you never get disturbed by a lot. I'm not sure that that will ever happen for me, but <laughs> maybe when I retire. But. So this is very much about standardization and make it simple to do the right thing. And it should be like hard to manually change things and it should be hard to do the wrong thing. I think this is uh, like super important and like the golden path that I was talking about. So I will talk about three different stories. three different I IDPs that I've been part of creating. I, I can say that two have been quite successful, one was a failure. Uh, so the first company is a company called Record the Future, working within threat intelligence. I was like one of the co-founders of that company 12, 13 years ago. Uh, it's today a unicorn, it means the valuation is more like more than one billion U US dollar. Uh, when we started, we were like 10 employees. Today, there are 800 employees. I'm, I'm not working there anymore. I quit like uh, four years ago, five years ago. Uh, but today, there are like 800 employees. They have like 1,500 customers, clients. Uh, at the time I left, I know we had like more than 70 plus microservices. And we had thousands of AWS instances, of petabyte, uh, petabyte of data. I would say the reason behind the success of, of Recorded Future, one of the main reasons was actually the speed of delivery of features. Because when we started to have an idea what we should do, we should like harvest a lot of the data in the internet and like to, to structure it into a database and make it searchable. But we didn't have like in which field and so on. After a while, and then also what we had also, we had that idea, but also when it started up, it was like a great team there uh, working together. Uh, after a while, we saw that threat intelligence was really great, so we started to focus on that area, and we were able to deliver a lot of new features on an insane speed. So that means that the company could grow, and also when we had a new customer, we didn't do customer-specific solutions, instead we did it like a feature in the product for a different type of customer requirements. So by that, we were able to adopt the product to, to the customer as well. So I think that was a, like a main, main reason for the growth of Recorded Future and the success. That was the IDP. And, uh, and, and the, what, what happened was that the developer developers were able to focus on writing code that make it, made a difference that they could focus on. They didn't, they didn't care about the infrastructure. They didn't care about management of services and so on. 
they just can focus on the features. And at that time we were like, it took just a couple of hours to get a new microservice up in production, or, or create a new microservice and get it up in production. Uh, also what they have, they have like support with boiler code around the A error handling and things like that as well. So that was a part of the IDP as well. And at the time they put something in production, it was not only that they put the microservice in production, by having those standardization around like logging metrics and things like that, they get logging, they get like metrics dashboard immediately, they get the logic automatically created and everything around the service as well. So by just using this boiler code and using the processor, they get all, all that for free. So they didn't have to think about, okay, what type of alerts do I need? Uh, if there was some really specific alerts, I had to think about that. Or how should I do the logging or everything like that? They didn't have to think about it. It was just out of the box for them. And how that started in Record the Future? I would say it started like 2010, I think it was. I was on a DevOps conference in Hamburg. And then John Willis was there, and he, he, he phrased this CAMS. I think you have seen it, most of you have seen it. But it was about culture automation, monitoring, and sharing. And, and we tried to create that culture and record the future where developer and operation worked close together, uh, really close together. Also, <coughs> we focused a lot on automation. So we spent a lot of time to automate all the stuff with creation of microservices, with deployment of microservices, uh, and so on. Uh, and then we focus quite much on monitoring, and then also sharing. Sharing the knowledge within the company, like internal meetings and everything, and internal discussions, but also sharing outside, and also take learning from outside as well, into the company. So we, we automate uh, like configuration management, all infrastructure, we automate the continuous integration processes, the continuous delivery, and so on. But we also put a lot of requirements on the developer. It's not that you can, it was not like you can do whatever you would like to do. So like no singleton processes, the process has to be able to run in parallel, many processes, so it has to be stateless and everything like around that. Uh, the only way to get the code into production was to deploy via deploy pipelines. That was the only way. They, they didn't have... Uh, it was re really hard for them to, to, to do deploy or, or fix things in production. Uh, also, the need to build for a chaos monkey. Actually, th this is... Uh, yeah, so, so we, we actually start to use spot instances. And I told the developers that the reason why we need to do spot, uh, use spot instances is because we need to save money, but actually the reason behind that one was to create a resilient architecture because with spot instances we get the chaos monkey without running a chaos monkey. And by that we get a really resilient uh, product and, and, uh, and set up. And also we introduced to start to use a lot of messaging between the, between the services as well. That was like a part of getting it resilient as well. Uh, also, we had those wrappers around like messaging clients, database clients, and things like that. We also had trunk-based development. Actually, we are quite happy because we use Subversion. It's a great product uh, because it's a nice feature because you can't do feature branching in Subversion. It fails all the time. So, and that was really good for us, I would say, because that forced us to do trunk-based development. And that makes it much easier to have this internal development platform as well, with the pipelines and everything. And also it forced us to, to start to use feature talk as well. At that time there were no services like launch dark or something like that, so we created by itself. But we had like a feature toggle me mechanism there. Uh, so feature toggle was super important, and then we have, had the monorep as well. I think monorep is quite nice because you, you own the code together, and, and it's easy to maintain when you're building it in the same way. So this is a little bit how, how it looked at Record Future at that time, uh, with a code repository, and then we initiate build and did that in, in Jenkins and so on. Uh, we had uh, every artifact we put in S3, and then we put it in auto-scaling groups, I would say more or less the same as Kubernetes. And then we used those tools like Grafana, uh, Kibana, Sensor, and so on. It was not much about user interface. Actually, we didn't have more. I think the user interface we had at that time was actually Jenkins, more or less, I would say. 
uh, that the developer use. But it's not like creating fancy use interface and things like that. And the, then they can see the result in Grafana and Kibana and so on. So at Record the Future, we had like one team to create and ma maintain this IDP. I think we were called sysadmin team to start with and then later on infrastructure team. Uh, or DevOps team or, or, or whatever. No, today you call it platform team, but uh, doing the same stuff all the time. Uh, and then we had what we call a backend team. It, it doesn't mean that they developed the backend, but they were like responsible for those common code, like those wrappers that I was talking about, or, or like uh, common how, how to standardize naming around metrics, for example, and also standardize standardized logging and things like that. And the nice thing with this backend team was that we, we put the very best developers in that team because this type of code will run a lot of time, but also it's quite complicated. So we put a lot of error handling for messaging, for example, in that common code. And also in this common code, we put a lot of logging, metrics and everything. So when you put a microservice in production and use this common code, you will get like metrics for every every query for a database, for example, and the length of the query and everything. So it was like super easy later on if you had a problem, you can say, okay, now this query is starting to grow or we're doing much more of this. But the developer didn't need to think about that because we put that in the wrapper, wrapper code. Uh, but I think it's, well, that, that it's super important. You should have your best developer doing this code because this is super important code to make it stable. And also, it's, it's, as I said, it's quite hard code to write, I would say. But also, what was super important, that was that we had very strong management support. <coughs> and they, they supported the way you work. I think maybe it was because a lot of features was, uh, was released. Maybe that, that was the reason, maybe. But also, they were working like in the background. It was not like they were pinpointing, you should do like this and this and this. But you know that you have the support all the time. And also support to, to us other in the company as well. So I would say management team, like, like you see on the picture there, that stands in the background and are ready to, to interact if they need, then they will do it. But that's super important. And that was uh, really great at Record the Future. And also, the IDP is a platform, it's not a user interface, I would say. Like uh, on Record the Future, it was not very much. We, we didn't have any user interface for, for the IDP, actually. And, but it, like, and it consists of many tools, and you have like, different UIs when it comes to like, metrics logging and things like that. So it's not to create some fancy application. Internally, it's more gluing. So I would say you can, you can work like when a team manages everything by themselves. And this is uh, actually a Swedish car as well, it's Koningsegg. And this car is like three, four, five hundred thousand euros or something like that. Uh, and, and there uh, the team are doing most of the car, they are manufacturing a lot of, of things on the car on, on the same place and on the, the same team. You have to uh, you do a lot of manual work. You have to have a lot of knowledge within the team, and I would say it's quite expensive. Instead, with the IDP, you should focus on standardization. So this is T4, and this is, a, this is a, I would say, where, where IDP belongs to. It's, a, it's about standardization, that you need to do the stuff in the same way. So, so, Depends on what you would like to do, but most of the business, they would like to have a feature out in production. That is the only thing that measures for a business normally. Uh, so there, there I think is a quite big difference between the different models. So what did we standardize at Record the Future? We standardized a lot of things actually. Uh, <coughs> I think the one, one of the most important things was actually the naming of the processes. We used the same name all over the place, and that drove the, the optimization all over the places. So you're quite sure that the, you can put that name wherever and you will get like the right dashboard, you will get the right logging and everything. So we didn't mess it up uh, there uh, with, with the na names and things like that, or conversion or anything like that. So we followed that. Also, we standardize on development language, or we had support for GVMs, 
with Groove Scala and, and we had like one track for Python, but we didn't introduce a lot of new languages and the team was not allowed to introduce new languages either. Also we standardized some database engines at the, uh, in the end we used MongoDB and, and uh, Elasticsearch and then S3 as well. It's pretty good as a database engine, I would say, for some use cases. Uh, and before we started to use MySeq, where we used DynamoDB, but all the time when we changed database, we changed it for everything. So it was not that we need to maintain all the legacy databases as well. So we like took a step, so we standardized on the databases. We standardized the build process, standardized the deployment process. And as I said, we had a like feature token that we standardized. We standardized Euron tool. And then DNS, that was also quite important to standardize. So we didn't have much of service discovery. We used DNS as service discovery more or less for, for everything. And that make it easy because everyone know what the DNS is and the DNS record and, and so on. So that makes it much easier. And you don't need a lot of tools or UI or things like that. So, so I think one, one super important thing was like this kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Try to make it as simple as possible things and not over complicate it. Uh, and uh, as I said, we standard uh, run monitoring, alerting, escalation, and so on. And those wrappers were standardized as well that, uh, that I talked about before. Uh, now we're talking about another company. It was a large company still making car in Sweden, cars in Sweden. Uh, so a huge company with like 30, 40,000 employees or something like that. Uh, in the IT organization, it was like two, three thousand employees or something like that. Uh, then a part of that IT organization, they would like to create an agile organization and they try to implement a startup culture to be able to compete with Tesla. Uh, I, I can say now it failed. Uh, I started to work there after Record Future because I thought it was, would be a fun, fun thing to, to do and see if I can change a, a large organization. I think it was, I talked with Chris before that, when I joined that, and he has done a lot of consulting, he says, and he said that you will fail. <laughs> and, and he was right, so, but, but I tried it anyway. And why it failed, I, I would say very much was about management. It was a really weak leadership. It was not a str strong buy-in to this one. And it was not a stri strong buy-in to build like a platform or a standardize or anything like that. And also, so, so to start with, it was like a decision we should use multi-cloud platforms, for example. Uh, every team could make their own decisions. So there were like no, no, no buy-in from support. The infrastructure platform team that I belong to was like more seen as a support team to help them when they have trouble and, and things like that. Could you put up some Kubernetes cluster, please, because we need that. And no strong mandates to anyone, I would say. And, and from technology perspective, it was like we were using different technologies uh, in the team. As I said, no standardization. The team could choose the technologies they liked. Uh, no team for common code. Uh, we tried to do that, but it was not like important because it was better that they worked to fix the problem they already created. And uh, different repos. I don't think that that was not a major issue there. But like people started to use like Azure DevOps to, to do build pipelines and then started to some did GitHub Actions to do pipelines and everything. It was so spread out. Uh, so that was a quite big failure. I stayed there for one and a half year and then I gave up. Uh, and some more gave up at that time as well. Uh, but now we talk at the company that I works for now at Phoenix. They, they started like eight, nine years ago, something like that. But then for like three years ago, something like that, they, they decided to re-architect the application because it was like a monolith. It was running in data center on hardware. It was like an installation per customer. Uh, and also it started to expand by, by buying new companies as well that needed to be integrated. So actually before I joined, they, they started to create this microservice architecture. Uh, and they start to route this monolith into services, uh, and and they have and they also went into a message-based architecture, and they moved to cloud and AWS. 
And we create an internal development platform, so we have like five minutes to create a new microservice and deploy it into production. Uh, we're the, almost there now. Uh, and this was based on the experience from like my experience from Recorded Future and the failing on the, on the the car manufacturer. Uh, but it's also also based on other developers' experience of, of different environments and so on. And, and this means that they could focus on like uh, features, and they didn't focus on like Kubernetes and other shitty tools. I still don't understand how it can be like 10,000 people on KubeCon. Is it that many, many working with infrastructure? I, I imagine it's a lot of developers that think it's fun to, to, to play around with Kubernetes instead of doing features. So we went from like uh, why we went from like one feature deploy per week to like three four deploys per week, and the, like uh, also the Kubernetes clusters were is treated like uh, cats and not pets, so we're able to restore like the full full operation in an hour or something like that. Uh, we haven't tried it out fully yet. Uh, lucky. Uh, but also it's, it's, it's very much about management. Here it has also been very strong management. So for one example, we had this monolith and we were taking out part of part to, to those microservices, but it was like we still did new features in this monolith. But then my manager of the C2, he said, uh, okay, now we will not do anything for four months. We will only focus on getting out of this monolith and we will not add any features. And he got the CEO to accept that maybe we will lose some customer even because it will be tricky to do this and we will not, uh, not deliver maybe what all the customers would like to see. So, but we did that. So in four months we didn't do anything with exception for getting out from this monolith into the microservice and we were successful on that one. But that is like strong management and you need that type of strong management if you should be successful. I think I was actually inspired by this. <laughs> I think this was 2012 or something like that. Uh, I think I've seen it before maybe, but uh, on the Etsy, they have like one rule that a new engineer on the first day should deploy to production. And how many can do that? Here, can you raise your hand? You they, they can, are able to do that in your... Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this was 2012. So we have this. If you would like to create a new microservice at, at uh, our company, we have uh, implemented this. It's a Jenkins user interface. So it's maybe not, not, not that nice. But you, I would like to have a new microservice. I just put the name here, and then I need to keep that name all over the place. I select which environment. CDEV is like our test environment. We skip the staging, and now we're doing testing production instead, because it was so hard to maintain the staging environment. Uh, and then also you would tell if the service should be private or public. Uh, and also if you would like to have a database uh, set up for it or not. Uh, and, and what you get if you set up, a, if you select yes on that one, you will get like a database in Postgres because we are standardized on Postgres. And then all the configuration of tables and things like that, that is done within the application. So we try to split who is responsible for which part of the configuration. So the infrastructure part is only uh, it's only like manage users and manage the database, but not like the tables or, or things like that within the database. So, and, and this is a little bit what you get. And if you look at in the top right corner there, you see a JSON file, and this is, JSON file is created from the user interface before, and that drives all the infrastructure. It says more or less that was what's in the what in that one. Here you can add like policies if you need some extra AWS policy or something like that. But this is more or less everything you need. Then you have a small JSON for setting up how many replicas or something like that, if there is specified for that for Kubernetes. But, but that, that, that is more or less. More or less. Uh, so, and and the, there are lots of stuff created. We create like uh, container repositories, we create the, like the database, IAM rules, we create uh, for, for metrics and for logging, uh, and so on. And, and we try to drive everything from like sim simple user interfaces. So, uh, with the exception for creating the, the microservice, the, the developer shouldn't need to know anything about Jenkins, or they should not need to be into Jenkins. We are actually using Jenkins. 
and most of the developers hate Jenkins and, and so I try to hide it from them or we try to hide it from them and quite successful. So like in GitHub we have that as a main use interface so there I can start with pull requests that we initiate builds and then we get the build result there. We have some infrastructure co config in the repo as well. Uh, we have common roads for the repos that we set up for, for pull requests and things like that. And also we're doing the deploys via release management in, in GitHub that take off a Jenkins job that actually, no, yeah, uh, and, and uh, that takes off the deploy. And then like we, we have those standardized dashboard here as well. So you just select your service and then you get a lot of graphs here and nice things. Uh, and then, then we use Argo Seed as a user interface into Kubernetes, but the developer, the only thing they look at, I would say, is the pods and, and maybe for how long they run, and maybe for the log when, when, when it doesn't start properly. But they don't care that much to the left, actually. Uh, we also out the generate documentation for the microservice. So, like, this is a Confluence page with all the links and all the service names and in different environments and so on and links to like logging and things like that. So if you have a microservice, you go to Confluence and then you can get the link to, to different user interfaces there. And also we put the Swagger documentation in Confluence as, as well to make it searchable. So those are tools used, used in the IDP at, uh, at Phoenix. So we use Pulumi for a lot of config management. Uh, we use JSONnet for configuration of, of, uh, of in Kubernetes or deployments and so on. Uh, JSONnet together with Tanka, uh, actually. Uh, and then we drive everything from Argo CD when it comes to deploys in Kubernetes. Uh, and we use GitHub, as you saw. Confluence, and then we're using some Ruby and, and a little bit of Chef as well for some instances. And also in Pulumi we selected to use TypeScript because most of the users, it's e quite easy for them to read TypeScript. And also a nice thing with TypeScript was that I, we had like front-end developer and when I start to use that one I can go to front-end developer and get help with the code and things like that. So that was really nice with, with starting to work with TypeScript. So the develop developers, the, the interface they are using is like GitHub, Argo Seed, and Confluence. Uh, so we don't have like an IDP portal or something like that. We just have those tools. Um, and what the developer says, uh, so, so like one of the players said, oh, it's so easy, it makes my life much easier because I can focus on, on the feature and focus on the code and don't need to struggle with infrastructure and things like that. Uh, and another one was talking about this focus on the code. And also, well, like we bought a company like six months ago or something like that that was running like in a in a data center more or less. And now the team that gets responsible for that one is uh, is chasing me to move that into into our process. And actually, like we we're running, we we're, we're using like uh, .NET Sharp or C Sharp. But we're running it in Kubernetes and on Linux and everything, and then we're using like open source things. But this product was, we need to run it in, in, on a Windows machine because it's some old Windows stuff as well. But we can use this, the same process for that one. So we're using the internal development platform for that. It's just that we run it on Windows, uh, Windows machine in Kubernetes cluster. But we adopt the same processes. And then also we have done it for the front-end developers now. So we have added the same process for their code as well. And then we have another company that we bought a while ago, and then we implemented the same processes for them as well. So we try to implement the same processes, but if we, it doesn't matter if it's different languages or even if we deploy like to, to S3 for front-end or to Kubernetes, but still try to use the same process as, as much as possible. And also it makes it much easier when you discuss internally at the company, because everyone knows what you're talking about, more or less. So it's not like, okay, we're using uh, MongoDB and we're using Postgres and uh, things like that, or we're deploying to Azure and we're deploying to AWS. It's, you get a common language and it's easy to work and share knowledge as well. So, and, and to get this to work, I say it's, it's super important to work close with the developers. 
uh, and the team managed IDP has to know that they are like suppliers to the developers so they have to be have a really good dialogue and doing this together and not like doing it separately uh, and have a good understanding and empathy is really important so yeah so this is a nice deal but I think and it's valid for a lot of stuff So, Kubernetes, 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 uh, yeah, it doesn't solve anything, or that technology doesn't solve anything. So, so what I learned is like, take the technology that you know about, if you know about it by yourself or within your team, take that type of technology, even if it's not the hottest technology or, or the most perfect. And then if you, if you would like to introduce new technologies, do some research around the technologies, find out what other has done, and don't be the first one on that technology if you don't want to create a lot of job for yourself. So, yeah, that's why an IDP can act as a turbo for business growth. So that's my presentation. Uh, I will be around there today if you have any questions or would like to discuss. Or are there any questions now? Yes? Uh, you went uh, from a uh, from a small startup to, to quite a bigger uh, company when when you sit into it. Uh, when did you start uh, building the IDP in, in the small company? Uh, I would say for, from the almost uh, not from the beginning but also we did have the tools set there, but quite early on, yes. So, and it was the same now with this company. They have been around for eight years, but they were restructuring the infrastructure and everything. So then we took the chance to build it from scratch there as well. So I think it's easy to start, when you start with something, it's, it's easy to do it. Absolutely. Yes? So a lot of the content is focused on the developer's uh, experience. What about the interactions with uh, your operations team, you know, networking, security. How does how does that kind of? It, it seems like it's obfuscated on purpose, obviously, but there still has that that transactions engagements need to happen. Yeah. Uh, how how can you describe a little bit about? It? Yeah. So the question was how about uh, it was a lot, a lot about discussion about interacting with developer, but how do you interact with net network security th team as well? I think on the on those smaller companies, it was like the same team. So there is one yeah. no major issue. But on the large company, it was like we tried to be like the senior point that discussed with the security network team and things like that. But that I think was quite successful because no one dared to talk with those team and didn't, the developer didn't know what they were talking about and things like that. So, so focus on getting that as a focal point for, for this team was quite important, I would say, if we had had like the developers with us as well. So you had a diverse uh, group of people centralizing the interaction. Yeah, yeah, it was like centralized, and then you need that needs human capital. Right? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Question. Uh, you uh, said that uh, your you took quite an opinionated approach in terms of uh, this is one of the things that didn't work, and the second uh, time around when the, each team wanted to do uh, things slightly different in the tool set and, and the way that they work. I found that. Uh, uh, an opinionated approach may be problematic in large organizations because different teams have different ways of doing things. So how did you manage to uh, come up with this standardization in a, in a pragmatic manner? If you can uh, give us your tips on that. Yeah, how, how you change like when you have a opinionated view on things and how you get into a large organization to change that. I think that was was failed on that, on that in that example. And I think it failed because we we didn't have support like from, from the management and things like that to do what they said that they would like to do, but they didn't support it to happen. So I think that was really hard. Then, then you can try to, what we tried to do it was to do like services that were excellent, that was much better than the thing they were doing. A little bit like, I understand like Google has that approach that you would like to have them to operate operations team for you, but we never ended up there, I would say. But I think you have to do something that excellent that you that the developer strives for, actually, would like to have. So. But it's the same, like, the, the way that 
because different things, excellent or fit, is different. So how did you manage to do one to fit all? Yeah, uh, at the large corporation we didn't manage that uh, actually, uh, but the, the idea was to do some excellent service that what the, the team would like to, to do use uh, and help them up. But in the other in the other organization we were quite successful. At the, at the Record Future it was like 100 developers or something like that, but they they saw the benefit of it uh, to do that. So, so it's, it's I think it's showing the benefit, and now and then you get a good strike strong buy-in into it. But it's hard to change an existing organization. And, and Chris to, to, told me that before. He has failed a couple of times as well. Okay. Thank you.